Sorry, that was a joke. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> and, and the quality <laughs> virtual people can also see it as well, Pati. <laughs> 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 cool. All right. Relax, let's, let's do this. So, first of all, I would say this thanks Cognizant for sponsoring the event. Uh, this is Melbourne and Sydney. Cognizant is sponsoring uh, the entire lot. Uh, Rax has been very supportive of the event and uh, we wanted to do this in person. He really was all up for it, although it is very challenging. It could be challenging given the situation, uh, but thank you very much. And Rax and I are going to share some of some of our journey. So let's kick it off, shall we? You don't have anyone. Yeah? No, cool. no, they can wait. All right. Um, so maybe let's before we get into what we are going to talk about, let's get into who we are and why we are doing this. I think it is important uh, because that plays into the entire narrative or the entire story today as to who we are, where we come from, what are our, you know, our thinking or our expertise. Probably I'll let Rax kick it off. Um, yeah, there's some pretty impressive pictures there. I think a picture that I do not look like at all. Um, anyway, I, irrespective of my picture, how cool does Petit look? Yeah, <laughs> it's like with the arms folded yeah, as well, right? It's so impressive. Um, <laughs> Those were the Jenkins <laughs> days. <laughs> um, so if you don't know me, my name's Rax or Rakesh or Rax as I go by. Um, I've done... Um, I've done various pieces of work um, across Australia, in the UK, Europe. Um, most recently, I think some of you know me from my previous employment, which I don't know if legally I'm allowed to say or not say, but I think if you look at my LinkedIn profile or ask some people in the room, they'll tell you where I work from and potentially where we took some of our learnings from, but definitely, definitely did not take our learnings from my previous employment. Um, I now currently work for uh, Cognizant as a head of technology consulting. Um, looking after um, essentially tr trying to work with organizations in the industry that want to do things progressively and want to think about progressive technology, um, whether that be in Australia or New Zealand, and uh, my remit is to help build those propositions and work with those organizations. Cool. Um, and a little bit about me. I, I work at a consultancy called Enabler as a CTO, uh, but primarily my job or over the last few years we've helped many organizations um, start their you know the platform journey or start their digital transformation journey there's a lot of um, tools and technology out there and it's very it can get very tricky and we'll talk about this today as well um, but the goal is not the tools the goal is how can you expedite the journey how can you expedite the or transform the organization help them deliver value faster so i've been working along um, various clouds, Kubernetes for last many years. And my passion, of course, is Kubernetes. Uh, but we'll talk about some of those things in the session today. So probably, uh, uh, yeah, we, we definitely have not rehearsed this. Yeah. Uh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a long weekend. So um, why are we doing a three part series? So a few things to kind of call out. So I think it's probably worth highlighting, Pratik and I come from very different Kind of backgrounds right not necessarily being indian that's that's a, <laughs> that's a similarity right but and my joke was poor <laughs> <laughs> got more laughs um and i hear sydney laughing from here so, um so there's if you look at a lot of my background a lot of my history um I, I would i would consider myself a technologist but to coin a phrase probably someone who's dangerous with a little bit of information um whereas Pratik probably has the depth to go deliver and actually go kind of realize and what we found was when we actually came together, best part of three and a half years ago, there were very two different views of the world that came together. Um, and I think we we left the place that we were in previously that I'm not allowed to talk about for legal reasons um, in a much better place. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some hypothetical learnings that we have for our career. Um, I've kind of just undone that point. So we do have some tangible experience and outcomes that we are going to kind of talk to and we're going to hopefully share some of those battle scars with you and and hopefully people can kind of take some learnings or or not um as the case may be um and what we'll also the when we thought about this we kind of kind of thought about there's something about showing maybe some of the work we've done or talking about some of our experiences but also um over those three years that you know we've built some good relationships and i think we have a good view of what's happening in industry whether it be within apac or within 
uh, Europe, within the US. And I think what we want to do is take the opportunity to ground the thinking, ground some of those learnings, but also give you a forward looking view of what we see is happening in the ecosystem um, and how we see um, the next few years playing out. Um, and of course, finally, um, like everybody, we love pizza and beer, um, which is actually the real reason, which is why I'm here. No, absolutely. And what we'll cover in this three-part series is, so when we're thinking about the content, we're like, there's so much we can cover in one session. Um, we could spend hours and hours talking about everything. So we've kind of broke it down into three parts. Um, so the first one is where, you know, why cloud native or platform engineering is important from a business perspective, right? Because that is something we all get asked, why am I doing this? Why should I invest in this? So probably that's the uh, to topic that we'll cover today. And in the further parts, like the second and the third part, we'll deep dive and see how we can execute in the, uh, on the strategy. Because it's not just hypothetical high-level strategy talk, but how do you execute that strategy and successfully you know, transform your business or wherever you're working for? Um, in the last part, we'll look at once you've done the ideation, once you've got the business uh, case, you've got the execution, how do you then operate it at scale? Um, you're not doing this for you know, a tiny... Uh, you know, few apps or whatever. How do you uh, transform your enterprise and keep it operating at that scale? So that's the idea with our three-part series. Um, hopefully, you all will get uh, some learnings today and in these sessions as well. And we'll see. Let's maybe dig in. We're totally not rehearsed. Um, cool. So the agenda for today. So one of the things we did want to, and again, this is us just footballing ideas, right? One of the things we wanted to talk about, why is there, what's the world today? Like, why are we even talking about these things today? Why is there a need? Shouldn't there be an easy? Yep. There's one option. Go select, go run it. And that's it. Um, and then we'll go and look at, if you go back to basics, how do you, you know, break this problem space? How do you break this dilemma and how you come out of this? by just going to basics. We'll look at what's called the platform engineering, uh, the new paradigm, apparently. Um, although it was when we started working together, we were talking about a lot of these things, but they're now formally called the platform engineering as a concept. And just looking at how do you actually know that you are at that level? Have you done platform engineering? Is there a done? How do you measure it? How do you come, you know, figure out are we there yet? And lastly, uh, we'll try to wrap it all together um, in a good summary or a messaging today so that, you know, there's enough information for you to take home and start working and looking at these things. By the way, all the pictures are from Rex, so do not blame me if you see something weird. I'm sorry, but you can't talk about cube or containerization without pictures of containers. That's just, <laughs> that's just default. That's just default. That one might be okay later down the track. It's not me. Just, just saying that. Um, all right. So shall we look at the world today? I don't know why yeah. you... <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> Totally not rehearsed. Yes. So what's the world today, right? So in today, if you, if you think about the technology landscape, right, there are way too many options. There are too many options for us to choose from, right? Um, there are way too many tech movements happening in parallel. There is so much going on in the industry that if you start designing a system today, you've literally got many, many options to choose from. Look at the CNCF landscape diagram for once, um, and you will know what we mean. Um, but we'll touch on some of those tech movements today and how they influence, how they influence this decision making, how they influence um, the business side as well. One of the first ones, obviously, I'm very passionate about is Kubernetes. Uh, when containerization came along, when things like Docker came along, when they made the whole container API mainstream, there was a need for container orchestration and scheduling engine. Kubernetes became the de facto choice, although not the only choice, but it became the de facto choice. But still, there are other ways of running containers today. There are other ways of running applications today. So this is one of the main, one of the major influences, I would say, in the tech, um, uh, tech today. Then folks said, you know, DevOps. DevOps came along. If I don't know if you folks remember or not, but first, when this term was coined, you literally had people explaining it with a figurative wall in between and dev on one side, ops on the other side, and <coughs> either throwing the ball over their head or something like that. But it had a major influence on our industry, right? Things have changed how we do things, how we um, update infrastructure, how we build code. Things have changed. 
But again, DevOps is one of those tech movements which is you know operating in parallel today with Kubernetes. It is not done yet. Next came along cloud native. Now, it was in the early days, it was very confusing because people were like, oh, I am using AWS, I am cloud native. It's not like that, right? Cloud native was about building applications or software in a, in a way that it is native to the cloud. It's reliable, it's uh, scalable, it's dependable, all of those ables. Um, then CNCF as a group came along, which you know really brought that open governance or the governance structure around projects and everything. And if you look at the CNCF landscape today, literally there's tons and options to choose from. And not just tons and tons of options along streams, but each stream has many options. So as a technologist, it's confusing. As a technologist, it's just too many options. Just tell me, go down this path, and I'll happily do it. Um, then came along observability. I mean, like people they had, I still remember when I used to have arguments around, oh, is it just monitoring rebranding? Or are you just looking at metrics? Why do you need a fancy word? But again, it changed how we think about operations today. It changed how we are thinking about monitoring, metrics, logging, everything today. Lastly, shift, shift left. Shift left, I said shift, I didn't say anything wrong, shift left. Um, this still, so this is a, I, would, I wouldn't say new kid on the block, but this is something that people are using a lot these days. Um, and every time you use this phrase, someone goes, oh, what are we shifting left? What, literally, what are we shifting left? But again, these tech, tech movements, going on in parallel have a lot of impact on how we operate as technologists, how we solution anything. Forget about business value and everything. It's just as technologists, we have to think about a lot of things. And there are still many others which I haven't touched on. There are more than these, right? So a question is, maybe a question for you, Rax. How does a business person see these things? What do you see when we talk about Kubernetes, DevOps, and Cloud native. I feel like I need to shake his hand and go, thank you, Pratik, <laughs> and then take over. Um, so I'll give you a different view, right? And this is not Rakesh's view. Um, as I said, I was a, maybe a career-born technologist that deviated a bit and, and dangerous with a bit of stuff. These are real examples of what people have said to me as I've started talking about some of this stuff. Um, definitely not in my last role, but a little bit in my last role. Cube. Are we going to Kubepedia? You, you literally... I mentioned the word Kubernetes, and someone said to me, Kubepedi. Right? Why are we going to Kubepedi? Right? And again, the context there is not that these people are you know, idiots or stupid or whatever, but actually, they don't know what this stuff is. Right? They have no idea. Like, same as you know, DevOps, one of the questions was, I totally get it. How much is one, and how many do I need? You know, the, the context of that question, again, doesn't come from a stupid. Well, actually, that one was particularly bad, actually. I'll give you that one was stupid, right? Um, if you talk to if you talk to execs in particular, but if you talk to non-technologists about cloud, they all talk to you about cost. Right? That's what's that's what's in the back of their heads. It's not about the stuff Pratik talked about. It's not about um, you know using latest services. It's not about abstraction of services that you don't want to invest in. What they hear is a cost play, and it doesn't help, right? When you have organizations going around going, oh, if you move to I won't say the cloud vendor because then I'm telling you who said this. But going around going, oh, it's 54% cost savings. Well, that's just nonsense, right? Like I, I, I don't think anyone here has probably worked in an organization doing some sort of cloud migration that got a 54% cost saving from an on-premise cost. It doesn't exist, right? We're not investing in cloud for that reason. But this is what's in their head. CNCF or GCP conferences and stuff, they are seen as junkets, right? They are not seen as learning opportunities. They're not seen as networking opportunities. They are flat out known, known to be, well, we're going to pay someone a business class flight and they're going to go off and have three days, wherever it may be, Barcelona or San Fran like myself. That was a little bit of a junket, but, you know, it was, it was still quite fun. Um, but, yeah, I didn't help the cause, right? But that's what they hear. Like when you talk about these foundations or, or, or these movements taking over and actually these, um, I don't know if you call them an organization, but a pseudo organization or whatever you want to call it, what they're hearing is actually a KubeCon con where they have to pay for someone to, to go out. You know, observability is interesting, right? Because when you start talking to people about observability, investing in observability or investing in a new paradigm, their head goes to no more outages ever. 
right? That's that's where their head goes to, right? So again, I'm trying to give you give you folks a view of when you are presenting some of these paradigms and what do they hear, what are they thinking, what do they think they're investing in, right? They're not they're not thinking around what does the new paradigm and monitoring look like, and therefore how maybe I can architect my services differently, and therefore I can manage my experience, and therefore I can identify experience issues. They are sat there going. It is going to be a system that's always available, and I'm going to get a bonus at the end of the year because I've got no outages, which we know is nonsense, right? We know that doesn't happen. <coughs> and shift left, uh, and uh, I've got you know Ali in the back, and I don't want to embarrass Ali, but he's the guy in the back who's putting his hand up right now. Um, he, he will he will be testament to this, right? Like when you talk about shifting left and various things to shift left, but various concepts of how do you embrace some of these movements far quicker in the engineering cycle? Security comes up constantly. But these are the paradigms that we have to deal with. These are the kind of views that people have, which is it can't be as safe. It can't be secure. What you're saying, Rex, is we don't care about our customers' data. We're not, they are not necessarily always understanding that what we're talking about is achieving the same outcome, but in a slightly different way or a slightly different paradigm that might be beneficial for a whole range of reasons. So I... Some of that is jestful, right? But some of that is, well, not some of that. All of that is real, right? Whether I've used a little bit of licensing with certain words, but the whole ethos of what I'm describing is absolutely real. People don't necessarily get the tech movements. They don't necessarily get what the value of some of these tech movements are. Um, and probably the biggest problem is they don't understand how some of these movements come together. And that's the gap we have to fill as technologists. It's not about... A big part of what we have to do is delivering, but a big part of what we have to do is showing people and explaining to people why these paradigms matter and how they matter. Yeah. Um, and just before we go next as well, and this is actually a true story. Three years ago when Rax and I started working together, probably we were discussing how to solve a certain problem. Um, and I would have talked about Kubernetes. I would have talked about containers. I would have talked about all of this. Um, Rax just sat there and like, yep, makes sense to me. How are we explaining it to them? And then here is figurative, and I don't mean it in a, depend, a demeaning way, but literally the question of why I should invest in this. There are two distinct worlds as technologists, what we see, and as business, what they see. Um, and until and unless you marry them, until and unless you have buy-in from both sides, any technological improvement or transformation that you are trying to bring is going to be hindered. You might succeed eventually, but it will be hindered. And I think that's the key in what we wanted to share, like the two different worlds, the, how the views differ, how their thinking differs. No, spot, spot on, spot on. I think I, I tell one story was when I first met Pratik and uh, there's another guy in the room on the front seat on the edge of the couch. Um, we don't talk about him because he asks really annoying questions, Simon. Um, Simon, but, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Simon, yeah, yeah. Not with an eye in the middle. Um, so Simon... Um, I, I had no idea. These guys started talking about Kubernetes and Istio and something else and blah, blah, blah. And they looked like it wasn't me, but in my head going Kubernetes, right? It wasn't me, but let's assume it was. Um, I used them heavily, right? For the first kind of three months, um, we had dedicated time in my diary once a week where I had a list of things. Not just understanding what some of the principles were behind the movements but understanding the movements allowed me to translate that a little bit differently to um, the people that might have been controlling the purse strings or the people that were actually making some of the larger decisions in terms of what we were going to do as we move forward so for me those kind of two or three months were kind of pivotal so if you hear me talking shit blame him and that guy over there <laughs> um, and for us as well right? like we stopped talking about containers kubernetes kubernetes it was all about the value that you're going to get it wasn't about the service mesh, it's about what are we trying to achieve. And that's how these two worlds, when they meet, your point of views change. And probably that's something we'll uh, see later as well. Moving on. I forgot who was doing this. Um, you go, you go. But before we go, you know, before we solve this, before we solve how do you solve this paradigm, like this can be like so many technology movements and everything. How how do you solve this giant problem of confusion? What's the is there a silver bullet? What can we do? He's so good with his <laughs> transitions, isn't he? <laughs> so amazing, right? So subtle. Yeah. So um, for, for me, I go I go back to the question saying, what is it? Um, 
what is it we're actually trying to solve for? Um, we're not we're not arbitrarily wanting to put everything in containers, even if it's a Windows workload that's the best Windows workload that entertains you for a couple of years, right? Um, why do you want to kind of do some of those questions? Or why do you want to do some of those things is a question we have to answer, right? And for me, I'm going to give you my point of view. Um, it's not the only point of view. Like it, it, you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to kind of go, well, that's the wrong priority order. There's other things. But I'm going to hopefully principally give you a view that I think stands up. Um, we do anything because of a customer experience. And I don't mean internal customer. I mean a customer, right? Um, whether you're a customer of Cognizant, whether you're a customer of Enabler, whether you're a customer of a bank, whether you're a customer of a retail organization, every investment, every dollar technology makes is for that end customer, right? That's what matters. That's the only thing that really matters, except for the other four things I'm going to say. Um, the second thing is, in the market we have today, right, is engineering experience. Um, I, I've had the privilege of the privilege of working with many of you, the annoyance of working with one, one person in particular. Um, it matters because, you know, like, A, we want to unlock your value. We want to unlock an engineer's or a technologist's value in terms of doing what you're good at, not the, the crap that doesn't allow you to meet the consumer need. Um, but two, like, quite, quite transparently, you're in a market today where if you have a really shit time doing your job, you're, you're not going to stay around. Like, the power of switching for any sort of technologist is huge. So, you know, if you are interested, Cognizant is hiring. And if you are interested in some of the stuff that I say, then give me a shout. Um, third is speed, right? You can't get away from speed. Like 100% every organization, whether it's in Australia, in the US, in the UK that I speak to or, or I've, you know, come across, all they are trying to do is unlock speed to market and the speed to actually innovate back on consumer, uh, back on competitor movements. Um, how do you get code? out the door quicker? Right? That is the key question that everyone's kind of looking at. Context of all of that is <coughs> you can't get away from the fact that an organization has operational cost budgets. It is just inherent. Like, sorry, but it's not a nice message for everybody, maybe in this room or in other rooms, but you can't go around switching tools. You can't do it because actually, what is the operational cost impact? You can't suddenly have 20 tools to do one capability. And you can influence what some of those choices are. You can influence what some of those principles are. You can influence, hey, how do we make those decisions that give us the best value for money? And even for me, right, I had a – just checking myself legally for a second. I almost had a blank check when I first started, right, in my previous gig. Um, it didn't take long for someone to start sitting there going, this PD nonsense, what is it actually giving us? Right? You're using X amount of money. That question is always going to arise. And then the final part for me is um, one of the things that we have to solve is bridging that business and tech divide. I think in a digital world, in a world where um, I'm about to say some numbers that I can't validate, but let's say 90 to 95 percent of the work we all do is actually to create a digital proposition for a customer. Um, you can't be working in an environment where there is a boundary between business and technology. It just cannot happen. It adds speed. It creates bad consumer experiences. It creates bad engineering experience. It means operational cost spiral. Um, it undoes. When you have these divides, it undoes all the other four things that you're trying to achieve, and probably many more. Right? There's probably sub things here. There's probably many more things that people can talk about. But for me, when I think about how I pursue some of my technology goals and how I think people should be thinking about theirs, um, these are five things that I think you are trying to solve for when you're trying to solve this paradigm or this problem space of so many confusing tech movements in one go. Yeah, very quickly though. So before, I think this is a very powerful thing. And again, as Rak said, these are five of our views, his views. Uh, for you, your mileage may vary. But one thing, I'll take an example in this, right? Um, so let's just say again, you're faced with the problem. There's so much confusing tech. Go back to first principles. Go back to the basics. Ask all of these questions. What is important to you? Where should you focus? And it's not you as an engineer, you as an organization. The you here is the organization. Now, let's take an example, right? Engineering experience. That's something I can speak to, right? If in an organization where you're working, you have to go through, jump through 10 different hoops, 15 different repositories, 16 different approvals, 17 different people you need to call, that is a bad engineering experience. 
It's not about running Kubernetes or not. Even if I'm running Kubernetes, if I have to do all of that, I am leaving that job in three months. That is bad engineering experience. You're not going to attract talent. You're not going to retain people. Again, the flip side of it is the technology that you're delivering. Is it going to be quality when your people are frustrated? Frust have you ever had someone saying frustrated people deliver best code? No, because they don't and they can't. So go back to the basics. Go back to first principles. Ask yourself, what is important for me? Me as in my organization. Is Kubernetes the answer? Maybe or maybe not. I would say yes, but maybe not for you. <laughs> Even technology might not be the answer. Something else might be the answer. But the key message to take away from this is go back to those first principles. Go back to the basics. Look at the vast confusion. Ask yourself the question, what are you solving for? What is important for you? Sorry, I had you. No, it's spot on. It's spot on. Can we? Um, sorry, Pati. Is it okay just to stop maybe for a couple of questions? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say. Yeah, go for it. Sorry. I no, yeah, I, I can hear the passion in your voice. You, you just want to just like keep going, keep going here. But I'm sure that uh, before we switch over to to Brad in Sydney, run to Adelaide, and we'll and we'll loop back onto Melbourne there just for um, any questions. Are there any advice? I mean, this br bridging the the tech tech and business divide. It's so so important. You know how um, how how would you suggest going about this? Like it's so so important to be able to understand in business terms how you know how how this technology is going to affect your journey. But how do you go about that sort of thing? How do you help to influence people above? Um, there's a really long answer, uh, but the short answer is, can we come back to that in about 10, 15 minutes? <laughs> no problem. I knew there was some the more good There's, a, there's, a, few, there's yeah. a future slide that covers that. Um, but let's take that on notice, Stephen. And um, if, if we don't answer it well enough, we'll come back to that question. Yeah, no problem. Let's go down to Brad, Brad in Sydney. Any questions, uh, Brad, down in Sydney there? We, we do, yes. Yes. So far away. Question? Oh, yep. Can I just? Uh, yeah, keep, or yes. Can I just, uh, uh, maybe just come over and to talk into the microphone. If you could repeat the question, that'd be, that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, just here. Yep. Um, hi, my name is uh, Song. I'm a senior technical duty officer slash site reliability engineer at ServiceNow. Um, I believe uh, Cognizant is actually one of our customers. Um, uh, I, uh, my question is, is um, are you allowed to uh, speak a little bit about uh, how Kubernetes is used at uh, your organization um, or at uh, Cognizant uh, specifically? Um, what service are you running um, on Kubernetes? And how are you leveraging um, Kubernetes to improve uh, customer experience? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> That's a very interesting question, and I'll give you a cheeky answer. It might not answer it directly, but that's what the part two is for. Uh, the execution of strategy and showing you deep dive into tech. Oh, that's no. where the part two comes in. So please come along to that one. <laughs> um, this uh, was not set up. No, I, I'll, add, so, I'll add some. I'll add we, some we lost you there for a second. We lost you there for a second, Pratik. Can you just repeat? Are that? we? Are we? Are we still? Are, yeah, are we still on? Yes. 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 Cool. Yeah. No. So, as I was saying, part two definitely covers uh, a good chunk of technology deep dives and strategy execution. Definitely will cover Kubernetes in detail because, yep, yeah, uh, it's one of my passion, uh, Kubernetes, and we'll cover some of it then. Um, I I don't. I don't think I can talk to uh, what my previous organization um, did or is doing, um, but I will definitely come back with a view of what Cognizant's doing in the second one. If I'm very honest with you, um, you, you go to a lot of these talks and you go to keynotes and stuff and people will ask questions, right? And they'll say stuff like, um, that's commercially sensitive or I'll pick that up with you afterwards, right? It's just code for they don't know. 
All right? It's code for I have no idea what the answer to your question is. So what I'll do is I'll pick that up afterwards with you. I will <laughs> break into commercial confidence. Uh, no, I, I don't know. But um, if you come back for the July 1 and ask, July, August 1, if you ask that question, I'll have a better answer for you. Yeah, no, definitely. I can go on for, with Kubernetes for hours. That's not the point. Um, okay, sounds good. Anyway, are there, are there Stephen or... Yep. Uh, we do have another question here. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Hi, Rex. Um, I guess the question was around, so, so I know a couple of times you kind of mentioned you were kind of going like, hey, you as in the organization need to do this. But I'm assuming like most of us are essentially don't have an organization. We just work in an, in an organization or we don't add that role in the management bit where we make those decisions. So like, things that you have on the screen right mm -hmm. now, so like customer experience or engineering experience and, and all the other bits, yeah. the five pointers, how any of us in, in, in when we're working for a client, for example, as part of Cognizant, or if you're working for your own organization, like how do you kind of um, influence the, those decisions as just being employees who are not either managers or who don't or who are not there um, in that decision-making process for, for those um, things, in a way? Um, I'll, I'll say two things here. One is um, we're doing terribly for questions, like zero for free is going to be the answer. We cover that um, in a little while. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Abby. Uh, Abby, we'll come to that in a, uh, in a little while. I will say one thing, though, right? Um, I, I, as I said, I've had the privilege of of leading, you know, large teams, and certainly in my last role, leading a, a fairly large team with a pretty advanced engineering views, engineering thoughts. And the question I got most often was probably that question, you know, like, oh, what can I do as a lonely engineer? What can I do as a a person just in this big machine? And you know, uh, how do I get empowerment? There's no, there's no secret to it, right? Like, if you want me to wave a magic wand and go, hey, everybody's empowered, then ta-da, you're all empowered. There's, there's things that we can kind of help you with, but I think the first thing is mindset, right? It is mindset. That is the only thing that differentiates people within a large organization is um, if you have a view of how things should be done, and I think there's context, we'll give you a view of how we see as a mechanism of how you solve this problem and how you go about and I say you as individuals or you as teams or you as an organization go about trying to embrace some of this stuff. Um, but there is no, there's no magic wand. Like it is literally lots of hard conversations. It's literally taking a lot of shit. Um, it is literally, you know, I'm not even jesting. It's people like Simon going, you know, Rex, you've become quite soft or, you know, you, you need to be pushing back more or whatever. And, and Pratik kind of reminding me, you know, we're trying to push the frontier, right? Like, there are ways and techniques which we'll share with you, but really, uh, to be honest with you, it is literally go off, go do, and go challenge. And context, how you position your arguments is important, which we'll, we'll come to um, in a few minutes. We might just uh, duck, duck down to Adelaide and see if there's, if there's any questions before we come back to Melbourne. Uh, that's it for us, thanks. That's it. OK, um, any questions for, from Melbourne there? No, they are. They've eaten way too much pizza. Oh, yes. they got very fun. Cool. fantastic. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. And that way everyone else can leave. <laughs> Back to you guys. Okay, pipe down. All right, let's move cool. on. Um, yeah, in the interest of time as well. Cool. So yeah, so these are again, as I said, um, these are our views or you know what what should be important. But the key there is going back to the basics asking that fundamental questions. What are we trying to solve or what should we focus on? Just doing something for the sake of doing it is not necessarily the answer always. Um, so how do we solve this? Like, OK, right, going back to the basics, we figured out everything. Let's say we have answers, technologies to choose or whatever. Then how do we solve it? What's the magic solution? Oh, this is me. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so. Uh, best part of kind of three years ago or three and a bit years ago, we kind of, what you're going to see on this slide is what we come up with. And, and actually people in the, the room right now were part of this journey, right? And I think it's very fair to say it was a bold vision three years ago. Um, 
but actually it's probably what should be the norm today. I'm not convinced it is. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced people are aspiring for it, but I'm still not convinced it is. But context, we've been trying to solve for this for three years, not just within our previous organization, not within Australia, just across the globe, right? And I think this is what we should be pushing towards um, still. Um, excuse, the pic excuse the pictures. There was actually very limited pictures I could use because so many of them charge, which is ridiculous. Um, I think engineers, um, and I'll rephrase engineers, I think people that are solving business problems using code, I think they should only have to worry about two things. They should have to worry about the code that solves the problem, and they should have to worry about some very basic configuration. Basic configuration for me does not include a target cluster, a target topology, a target VM. It includes configuration items like this is customer facing. This service has a level of restricted data. This service needs to talk potentially to other services that have restricted data, whatever it may be. I'm not here to define. That's where people far more intelligent and far more technical than me will actually go and try and solve some of this. I think once you have code and config, I think it should go into a factory. I think it should go into a black box, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we'll come back to that. And I think what should happen is that that black box or that factory should do a lot of stuff to that code, right? Now, whatever that stuff is depends upon the organization, the environment you operate in, the amount of regulation, but also where you are heading with that code. What is that code looking to do? And it should go to a customer in some form. A customer being someone utilizing a digital proposition, a customer being an exec using a report. and It could be anything, right? It doesn't matter. But the point being is that if an engineer can work on code and config, <coughs> everything else is abstracted from them, and they get very simple feedback. Your code or your config failed because, right? And then that outcome goes to a customer. Now, that, that's a black box. That red box is the thing that I think we all need to be focused on. I think that's what, in my head, I call a platform. That's my head I call an abstraction layer. In my head, I call a whole range of things. But it is that box I think we need to be focused on building. I think organizations do parts of that box well. I think, you know, if you looked at what ING did three, four years ago, you know, how you engineer or uh, how engineers had automated pipelines going through, that box was amazing. If you look at what Capital One did four or five years ago with AWS, their ability to provision cloud infrastructure was amazing. You look at what Netflix did or Netflix is doing in terms of their topology of target state using a microservices architecture and saying, actually, this little bit of change because it influences this customer goes over here was actually pretty amazing. But what I don't see is I don't see organizations looking at or doing very well what is that entire black box that takes abstracts all that complexity away of cloud, engineering pipelines, observability libraries, other acceleration libraries, it doesn't matter. The whole complexity of Cube, I might be stealing critiques under here because I'm not sure, but I don't see anyone doing that very well. All right. And three years ago, you know, you talk about this sort of picture and people are going, what the hell are you talking about? Like we're still trying to work out how we get Terraform embedded into an organization, let alone use it to provision cloud services. So for me, if you think about the five things or six things or whatever we've talked about, this model for me works. It means engineers, people that are solving business problems, again, let's not put them down as coders, people that are solving business problems can focus on the problem. They are focused on getting the stuff out the door as quick as possible because that red box looks after everything for them. They focus on the consumer experience because they get feedback pretty quickly. If you think about abstracting a lot of that complexity of tooling um, choices, that's what makes an organization expensive is choices. It's in that box. The organization needs to worry about those choices once. And because the value of abstraction is there, engineers or people don't claim and therefore or moan. Therefore, the engineer experience is better. And I can't remember what my fifth box was. Um, it's not the right answer. But sometimes things are complex and sometimes people need technologists to actually look after the complex things. The more you can put those things into a black box, the less you have to worry about that business and tech divide. Right, because actually people don't need to worry about it full stop, whether you're business or tech. You're using automation, you're using progressive movements to get rid of that complexity once and once and for all. Cool. Um, so in light of all of that, right, what Rax said, 
that black box, which is actually red. It's not black, but red box or black box, whatever. That black box, the technologies and everything. One of the things that is, you know, a new, not buzzword, but a new solution, it is platform engineering. But before we talk about platform engineering, let's, let, let's go back to this, this image for a sec, real quick, right? Think of it as, as engineers, right, who are solving problems. We've got features to deliver. There's a customer issue or you are fixing a bug. Do you want to worry about provisioning cloud infrastructure at that point? As DevOps engineers, as infrastructure engineers, yes. But as a person solving a business problem, should I be worried about those things? Or should something just take care of because I am solving a business problem? So that's question number one. Just keep that in your mind, right? Um, when I am, let's say, solving, uh, let's say, adding a feature to my you know, website or to my product, should I be worried about which CI, CD pipeline I need to trigger? What should, what my YAML should look like? Maybe not is the answer. More often than not, not is the answer. So how do we build this? What is this black, black, box, black box? How can we define it? How can we put it into words or terms that people will understand? So let's maybe, let's, let's attempt at defining it. Um, so this movement around platform in engineering or platform paradigm, it's nothing but building these internal developer platforms. It's about these technology platforms where you can abstract away all of the pain from your engineers who are solving business problems and automate them, solve them by using, you know, CloudFormation, if that's your poison, Terraform, if that's your poison, CDK, whatever, whatever that need be. An engineer who's fixing a bug or who's providing value to your customer should not be worried about underlying cloud infrastructure. Maybe that's a bold statement. Maybe it is. Maybe as a developer, you want to be worried about. But if we force everyone to go down this path, you're just creating a whole heap of waste. And I'll give you an example. I used to work for an organization where when the DevOps, um, DevOps took off, when people were you know, appending DevOps to their roles, what we decided was, hey, we'll build, a send, uh, we'll build a DevOps team where these DevOps would be seconded to each of the team. They will build infrastructure. The people will run it. People will own it. What ended up happening was across, let's say, 50 odd teams where we had 300, 400 odd AWS accounts. Every team was managing their AWS assets. They were managing their EC2s while fixing the code. What ended up happening, and this is a strange anomaly, and you will not be surprised by it eventually the quality of the code started going down. I'm not joking, I'm not making it up. I can't name the organization, but eventually the quality of the code started going down. And that organization is still suffering from that whole paradigm. Now, let's just say, let's fast forward to platform engineering, right? It is building internal developer platform. If as a developer, you come along and I say, hey, don't worry about any of this. You write your code, have the, write a configuration file, rest we will take care of as soon as you push into a git repository something will mobilize build it store it make it secure and run it you don't have to worry about it imagine what that developer and engineer has to focus on just their code they can build quality they can think about various other scenarios of solving the problems for customers they don't have to worry about this underlying thing. So that's part one. That is like the crux of platform engineering, internal developer platforms, which just expedite the development journey, your developer's experience. And again, it feeds into that engineering experience, right? As Rax mentioned, platform engineering is collection of these abstractions. Now, obviously, if you're using cloud, let's say AWS or whatever, GCP, Azure or whatever, if you don't build abstractions like, let's say, Terraform, code uh, that folks can use to produce or, or produce infrastructure like modules or whatever, or let's say um, some CI CD hooks, which people can just call and it will trigger a pipeline. If you don't create these abstractions, everybody has to solve it. Every developer, every development team will be solving. And you'll end up with nine solutions that look in 10 different ways and vary in 11 different places and you will never be able to reconcile. And again, I'm not making this up. This is from experience. We have, this. We have seen this. And I am 100% sure more, more, many of you will agree with this. And it's yeah. not about you know, restricting people, sorry. No, no, if you don't, if you don't believe us particularly on that point, uh, grab Jet for five minutes at some point afterwards. He'll talk to you about this because he, he, 
maybe too much information, but he, he might also have some learnings from his career. <laughs> yeah. So going back to what, what is platform engineering, cre creating this internal developer platform with abstractions, the right abstractions. Abstraction just for the sake of abstraction is not right. Simple abstractions which you know make it consumable for people, like putting a thin wrapper around your cloud, like a Terraform modules library or a CDK constructs library, something like that. That's what we're talking about. Um, and then uh, the other aspect is when you let people control their own infrastructure, they run their own things, there's also a, a big chunk of governance and risk that you're offloading to them. And more often than not, that will never happen. That governance will not exist. That security will not exist. It will, it will increase your risk posture. So, Going back, again, this is high level, right? We're, in the future talks, we will deep dive into some of these, but this is high level. Platform engineering means building those internal developer platforms which expedite the journey of your code, provide collection of abstractions that you can use to consume these platforms and cloud, or whatever you're using, um, and gives you a capability to centralize the governance, you can centrally manage all of those. What does this look like then? So think of it, and again, let's just take a few examples, right? If, if I'm using, let's say, uh, GitHub Actions as a tool, AWS as a cloud provider, Kubernetes as a runtime, my developers don't need to know this. Platform mobilizes, pulls the code from GitHub, GitHub Actions execute, chucks it into a package repository and shoves it off somewhere on Kubernetes. What Kubernetes? They don't need to care. Why do they even need to know Kubernetes? Again, this is a dream. Again, as, as, as we said, it was a bold vision three years ago. But if today this isn't becoming the norm, then we are in a problem space. Because you can't, and again, ask developers, when you go to them, you say, you build it, you run it, you know, what does that mean? I mean? You build it, you run it. It's like crafting 1,000 lines of YAML. That is not what they want. They're there to solve problems. They want to be debugging their Java, fixing their memory leaks. I'm not, I'm not joking. I've seen many, many developers just say, why YAML? I am not a YAML stitcher. So think about this. It's not a bold vision anymore. It has to be the norm. That is what platform engineering is all about. Um, again, at a very, very high level, let's very quickly break the parts that I just took as an example. There's a build part of it. There's a run part. And there's an observe part. We'll talk about the others as well. What does, what does build mean? If you if you start asking your developers, hey, you need to build your own Jenkins, then you need to build your own pipelines, you are failing as a platform engineer. They are investing too much time already in the things that are non-essential. You need to build simple consumable interfaces, something like a YAML file or a hook that just triggers some CI. Again, I'm saying vague technologies at the moment because next iteration is when we go into the specific. But the idea is provide these abstractions, make it easy for them to consume. If to create a CI, you have to check into five different repositories, you are, you are degrading the engineer's experience. If you have a tool chain, like one tool for CI, one tool to run your testing, one tool to do your security testing, like an array of seven or eight tools, you're, think about the cognitive load you're putting on your folks. They have to tool, they have to context switch. And 100% sure there will be something wrong in there and will compromise the quality of your artifacts. So build an integrated tool chain. For them, it should not matter if you're using 10 tools or one tool. Their consumption interface should be simple, one single interface. And lastly, quality. People don't talk about quality. A platform engineering centralization is all about building this quality and security into the platform, into what is happening with your code, right? Provide that safety net, rather than it being a paper-based exercise, provide that safety net of security on your platform. So that's the build part. So think of it as logically, as soon as you push your code, there's a build part that you know is trying to build your code and easy to consume interface and integrated tool chain, because some of the key aspects. <coughs> Next comes in, and again, as I said before, this is high level, so don't worry about too much um, how Kubernetes topology, what Kubernetes topology, we'll go into some of that in the later sessions. But the run aspect, cloud nativity is all about how you create your applications, right? In modern approach to software development, 
building scalability, reliability, all the abilities into your applications. Adopting these patterns, if your teams have to solve for provisioning a cluster, are they going to be solving for this? They might be, but you're just overloading them. Provisioning of your cloud infrastructure has to be automated today. That's all platform engineering's core, uh, not constructs, principles. Provisioning has to be automated. It could be pull request based, whatever, but it has to be automated. There's no manual pushing of punching of keyboard to provision something. That's just going backwards in the paradigm. And lastly, orchestration of wor workloads has to be simple. Why an API of if it can be? And I'll give you an example. Um, before I started working with Kubernetes, I used to work for an organization where they were not in favor of Kubernetes, but they still were in favor of SCPing jar files onto EC2s and then running the jar files as a unit file. I mean, yeah, fine, if that's your poison, but there's only limited number of times you would do this. I'm 100% sure if you have to do it again and again and again, flip tables, work out, I don't care. <laughs> so orchestration and management has to be simple. Provide an API, run an abstraction around, doesn't matter. Kubernetes does provide you that abstraction, but whatever is you, you can use, if you don't want to use cubes, whatever. But it has to be simple and uh, easy to manage. Lastly, observability as another paradigm, as I said, it came along, but it is a, a crucial part of platform engineering, right? If I have to hop into every different system to figure out what's happening with my applications, we are, we are failing the paradigm or we are going backwards in paradigm. Make your system interrogatable from outside. People should be able to interrogate their systems without logging or touching their systems. That is the fundamental. And this is where platform and uh, engineering score pillars are, you know, run, build, run, observe. Again, if you make it onerous for people, now you have to include five different libraries, write code in certain way, they're not going to. That's why auto instrumentation is also a key pillar of this. Lastly, again, as I said, images are not my fault. These are put in by racks. I don't know what QV is doing here, but anyway. Um, when you're building a platform, right, you've selected technologies, you've done the whole due diligence around what problem you're trying to solve, you compile like a run, build, build, run, and observe stage. Until and unless you measure something, you're never going to improve it. This is a famous quote by Peter Drucker, right? If you can't measure something, you will never improve it. You have to measure. And what do you need to measure from a technology? And this is purely technology standpoint, right? Frequency of your releases. How quickly can you change the system? Success rate of your releases, the quality of your release. If you're releasing code, which every time breaks, what's the point of releasing fast, right? If every time your customer suffers, what's the point? And lastly, your success of technology uh, platform, how does your organization compare with the peers in the industry? That's a simple thing to measure, right? So platform engineering, again, let's go back to it. Choosing right technologies, making it easy to consume for your engineers and taking away the pain. Those internal developer platforms is all about taking away the pain. And then lastly, measure. If you don't measure, you will not improve. So how do we know? Are we there yet? It's me? <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure you see it. All right. So um, let's just go back, go back a couple of steps. Sorry. So first of all, what we did was <coughs> give you a view of these paradigms and go actually there is no correlation or minimal correlation between what would be people actually executing the paradigm versus people consuming the paradigm, right? Like I said, there was mismatch. We then decided to talk a little bit about, well, actually, what's the problems we're trying to solve? And we talked about the consumer, the engineer, speed, cost, whatever else. And what Pratika started to do is kind of talk through a potential solution. And we still believe it is, I'm sure there's others, but we still believe it's probably, um, the most relevant solution, I guess, or probably the most important solution out there around building these abstractions into a platform and then engineering the platform in a way that gives you those abstractions, give you that confidence, and then allows you to achieve those five things we talked about. And hopefully, 
either bridges or eliminate some of those bridges between business and tech. But he kind of finished with measuring, right? And, and for me, when you start talking about what measuring is, um, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk to the kind of points, right? But I mentioned the cost question, right? Because basically, it comes up every time. It comes up. You are spending X, and it doesn't come up in the reason of hey, you are spending too much. But people want to pivot the combo around a little bit, right? If you provide X more, then this is what we can do. So how do you provide a view that allows you to justify your investment? And you flip the conversation. You, the conversation becomes the more you invest, the more I unlock value. Um, you have no choice in any modern organization to be able to demonstrate value and demonstrate progress. There's the, the, you don't have a choice. I'm sorry, but most of us, maybe not most of us, but a lot of us work in shareholder-owned businesses. That is just the harsh reality of working in a large enterprise or even an enterprise or even something that's owned by an individual or a group of individuals, you have to be able to demonstrate progress and demonstrate what's the value you're creating. Um, if you're not careful, it gets really qualitative. Our engineers are happier. Our customers are getting more. Our customers seem to be happier. We seem to be getting more engagement. Our NPS might be a little bit better. Right? All of these things can be quantifiable, right? If you're not careful, you start to measure things or lack of measurement starts to push you towards qualitative measures. Um, lucky for most of us, uh, industry standards started to emerge about how you, certainly in the technology field, how you start to measure value and progress. And Pratik's talked to it, right? And uh, I was told earlier that potentially if you use Dory the Explorer logo, there is a chance you get sued. And I thought, well, we'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but Dora came out, right? And Dora was there, or Dora is there, to give us a framework. And it's based on, I, I won't steal some of the, the thunder, but it's actually based on some experienced technologists who have started to look at a large number of organizations and go, well, actually, how do you measure some of this progress? How do you measure some of the investment? And probably most importantly, how do you measure the effectiveness of the investment that is being made? Cool. Um, and yeah, that is what Dora is. Like it's it's a research, it's a research-based outcome that uh, folks like Jez Humble and Nicole have done, and they've come up with, you know what, there's actually a correlation between performing well on some of the key metrics that they've defined um, to you know how a technology platform functions. Um, and as I said, when we measure things, and I'm going to just whiz through this because deep dives will cover a lot of it um, in future sessions. Um, it's probably broken down into velocity and confidence. The top two metrics, if you look at them, uh, the lead time and deployment frequency, they talk about velocity. The bottom two are about your quality or confidence. So if you look at it, Dora talks about velocity and confidence. You can't improve velocity without improving the confidence in that chain, right? And where Dora cements this knowledge in is they've surveyed for last eight years, many organizations across the globe, folks like Netflix, folks like you know, Amazon and the others. And that's where this research comes from. Thinking about your lead time, your deployment frequency, mean time to restore and the change fail percentage. These are the four key Dora metrics to measure on. But again, Think about when we talked about measuring, we're still kind of still measuring the technology side, right? It still relates to technology. And maybe Dora isn't enough. Beautiful transition. Um, I think the, the, key, the key to, there's probably two things here, right? One is you can start to see that it's becoming quantifiable, which is great. Imagine the power of having a conversation with an exec or someone who has purse strings to say, I can improve the lead time to change, or I can reduce the number of failures or improve the uh, mean time to recovery with this investment. You start to really quantify, hey, where's the money going? What are we actually getting for that money? What are the results we're going to see? Which is one of the things we talked about at the very beginning, right? Which is that mismatch. People don't understand cube. They don't understand observability. The moment you can start to pivot that conversation a little bit behind these, you suddenly start to see a very different response. Um, I think it's right, though, it, it, it is still transactional in terms of technology execution, technology pace, technology confidence, right? It doesn't really take into account, and a different way of thinking about it is, how do you know you're still choosing the right work? 
you might be doing work that's really quick and you might be doing work that has a high level of quality and doesn't fail. But how do you know it's the right work to be doing? How do you prioritize? So for me, and I'm sure Pratik agrees, but if, I doesn't, I, if he doesn't, I'll speak for myself. Dora isn't enough. It gives you a good view of how good your engineering shop is and whether some of your investments are making, but it doesn't go as far as bridging those five pillars I talked about at the very beginning, which was around heavily around you know, how do you balance investment on the right-hand side, for sure, but on the left-hand side, how do you balance experience? And probably, I mean, there is something. So if you think about it, what we've talked about, platform engineering, solves the platform problem, solves the engineering experience problem, but still we're not talking about the customer. Like the end customer, we started with, that was one of the five key pillars, right? We're still not talking about the customer. How do we bring this together? What is you know, you've got good technology platform that is expediting your delivery of code, but are you delivering the right thing? Is there a way to bridge this? Pratik, I've got a great answer for you <laughs> to that question. I'm, I'm learning of these transitions. Um, um, everyone should have heard about SRE. If you haven't, I'm sure you can Google SRE, right? It's not, it's, um, it's out there. Um, no, we're good, we'll start. Um, where, where we started to tackle this problem from acknowledging Dora is not enough, acknowledging that we wanted to make a huge investment in platform engineering and actually develop those abstractions and blah, blah, blah. We started thinking about how do we bridge the experience gap? How do we bridge that consumer gap, uh, experience into engineers or the consumer, right? And what we found with SRE, and I'm going to talk about a couple of high level things and in particular, we'll actually talk to you about really what SRE is. Um, the first thing for me was, um, I, I, I was one of the people that went on a junket to San Fran uh, before the pandemic. And when I went on that junket, one of the things that I was able to do was actually go meet with the SRE team at Google, who, if you're not aware, SRE was a, a term and a methodology coined by Google. And one of the things that they hammered into me at that point that I still talk about is that SRE is actually a language. It's a language that bridges technology, bridges business, it bridges the investment required, it bridges... Um, failures, it bridges how do you balance the time of an engineer versus a consumer need. It's essentially the entire methodology is about bringing a consistent language across all the people that play in that ecosystem, whether you're consuming the service, whether you're prioritizing what happens to that service, or whether you're executing the service and delivering the service. The second thing for me was, and what SRE starts to really do is start to manage expectations and balance those expectations. As a consumer, what do you expect? As a person providing that service to a consumer, what is it that that service is going to look like? Therefore, are you going alpha, beta, GA? In terms of investment cycles, in terms of you being a product owner, well, how do you then start to prioritize, hey, where am I going to put my money? Right? You have a finite bucket of engineering talent, a finite bucket of engineering resource. You start to then balance those expectations, and then you can proactively manage them. Right? Like I said it earlier, when, when business people have historically heard about SRE, uh, observability, their thought process goes to, uh, it's available all the time. If I make that investment in Dynatrace or uh, New Relic or uh, what was the one that was more famous before, the App Dynamics, that solves my problems. That's not the case. But what we start to now do with SRE is balance some of those conversations and say, actually, this is what you can expect and this is what the reality is. And therefore, if you want to do something about it, then there's an investment or there's a balance off or a trade off required. The final part for me was, um, as we started to embrace this and start thinking about this, it started to shift a big paradigm within a large organization. What we started to do was see that bridge between tech and business divide. We saw engineers focus more on what is the consumer experience I'm building for, because if not, you were going to have to pick up that debt. You knew that was going to come back. You knew you couldn't hide away from that. It was going to come back pretty quick. You had business people or product owners or product managers starting to think about actually where the investments I need to make. And what you started to see, and, and I, I don't think you know, any organization is there yet. Um, I, I'd argue Google included. I think if you speak to people in Google, they'd, they'd, they'd argue that there's a long way to go for them themselves. You started to see execution shifts, cultural shifts, process shifts, and people started to line up behind, well, actually, how do I line up behind this model in terms of SRE? which then allows me to deliver in a slightly different way and deliver slightly different things. So they, they were the kind of free takeaways from me, and I'm sure Pratik's going to talk a little bit about well, what is actually SRE on the ground. Yeah. So, again, as we said, the third part of the series definitely around how to operate at scale and SRE and everything. But one of the core things 
that SRE as a language brings to this whole platform world, this entire thinking is you start thinking about customer. You start about you start from the customer. You draw the customer journey maps. Like for instance, if you have a feature, you draw the journey how your customer is traveling in your system, how is it using your system, how they are using your system, what's the experience like? Based off those, you create your indicators, your objectives, the SLOs, SLIs. Then you work backwards from there, improving your code quality, focusing on features that matter. I mean, I can. I can forever, you know, write, start writing Golang or whatever and build internal tools. But until and unless I know people who are consuming these tools, what is their experience like? What's the point? You're not going to improve those. So SRE is definitely that language, which is kind of the glue for this entire, you know, platform, realm, whatever you want to call it, these movements. Until and unless you start talking in what's your customer's experience in your system, you're not going to improve these systems. And I have seen the transition in engineers myself when, when we started, and again, this goes back a few years, when we started thinking about, okay, what is SLO, SLI? Obviously, initially, we didn't knew about any of those, but we started thinking about SLO, SLI. We started drawing journey maps, customer journey maps. Our design, the way we design system changed from, I need a Kubernetes to wait, hang on, what are we solving for? What is our customer experience? Is Kubernetes going to provide the best customer experience? Or is it a Lambda function? Or is it a Google function? Windows cluster. Window, <laughs> Windows cluster. <laughs> EC2 instances. I don't know. See, this is where you know SRE is that new language or kind of a framework which lets you wrap this new paradigm and start reasoning with it. You might not be perfect from the get-go, but this is where how you bring it all together. This is is how you shift the paradigm and once you start doing it you will realize your thinking changes from high containers kubernetes to what are we solving for okay there's, there's a lot to take in um and relax we're in the home straight and for those in melbourne relax there are cold beers in the fridge so you don't have to have warm beer and there's leftover pizza so um when when we talk about this and you know whether it's um you know uh, like a setting like this or individually there's generally a conversation that going to arise and say okay i get it you you've talked about the problem you've talked about a potential approach you've talked about what you're trying to invest in and and you know you guys are chatting about this vision which is i get it and and i like, get dora now and i'm now an sre i'm going to go get, if i can't get a job at google i'm going to have to go do some platform engineering work the question always arises, how do you get going or how do you start a business case? And I was being a little bit flippant earlier around the magic wand, right? Going like, there's no such thing as a magic wand. But I do think there are tangible things that you can do um, to kind of get you started. Um, we've talked about it so much, right? Every organization that I either talk to, have worked in recently, or I, 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 I potentially will work in, no doubt, customer centricity is everything, right? Like that is... All that matters is, hey, in a digital world, what is the consumer experience? And I think the more you can ground behind that, the more you can start to actually influence some of the decisions that are being made. I think you cannot get away from this balance of cost and value. You can't. I'm sorry, but you can't. You can't get away from it. Um, uh, again, it was actually in my previous organization, but in my organization before as well, was that tool that you know we thought was going to do some CD work is really, really shit. Let's switch. Well, the problem is the switch actually costs half a million dollars, takes another six months. And at this point, our engineering customers are still going another six months with no potential CD product. Right? Now, these are the balances you have to make. Sometimes that decision will make sense. And sometimes it won't. You know, sometimes you have to do Windows clusters. Sometimes you don't. You know, that's just the reality that we have to live with. I'm just preempting Simon's question. So I'm just giving Simon a lot of, a lot of hard time. The more you can demonstrate value that offsets the cost, I promise you the conversation becomes a lot easier. It doesn't matter if you're talking to, um, it doesn't matter if you're talking to me, one of the execs, Pratik, anybody in this room, the more you can start to have the conversation around the value we are creating, again, quantifiable. I don't care if it's Dora. You don't have to use Dora. Use something else. I don't care. But the more you can quantify that back to a metric, to a measure, and the more you can offset the cost versus value, I promise you people will listen. That is 
outside of SRE. That is a language that I have seen work most effectively. Um, definitely watch the Lion King if you haven't seen it. It's a good film. Um, but find your tribe. Right? It's a common thing that people say is find your people, find your tribe. If you want to go and still change, I, there, there, is, there is no magic wand. Go find a group of people that want to go and still that change and go find your tribe and go make stuff happen. That is the only way things happen. I don't, I don't care if you are a, a, a CEO, a group exec, um, a middle manager, people like us, it does not matter. That is the way you make change happen. And I, I, I do talk about our CEO, Brian, who's a Cognizant CEO. And, you know, we, we had him over here for the F1 and we were jesting about certain things. I was doing an F1 preso and I made some jibe about, um, you know, how annoying is it when someone's listening to you, when you're working and some, your boss is talking nonsense to you while you've got your headphones on, right? And it was a bit of a jibe at Brian and the execs to kind of go, look, you know, these, these people. And he made a really good point, right? Which was, he goes, oh, you guys laugh. I might be the CEO, but I have 12 bosses. They're all the board members who are constantly on the phone to me. He, he has the same issue. Right? He is trying to demonstrate value. He is trying to find the people in the organization, the board members that we all do on an everyday basis to go make change happen, right? So find your tribe. Um, get a bulldog, right? That, not just because get dogs are the best, and I have two dogs, and I, if, I had, if I had the chance to get more, I would. Um, my partner's not on the call. Otherwise, this would be a great pitch to get a third dog, but that's not going to happen. Um, get a bulldog because um, it helps. It really does help. Um, I'm sorry, I should explain. Bulldog being, get, get a leader or get someone aligned with someone who can actually go power through doors for you, right? Um, I, I'm not to say that I was particularly good at it, but I think if you ask people about Simon and Pretty, one of the things that they say about me was, you know, I was maybe a placid bulldog, but I was a bit of a bulldog to go make stuff happen. Um, and we did as a, you know, as an organization, we got our own bulldog, you know, who was actually quite impressive and put me to shame. But, um, Get someone, work with someone as part of your tribe. Identify someone who can go power through those doors, right? That's what, that's what it takes. It takes people to knock those doors down and align the conversation back. Cost, value, consumer. Um, my final bit of advice would be is go do. Um, people, people spend way too much time talking, way too much time trying to create strategy, way too much time trying to create documents, way too much time creating design docs or architecture documents, um, go do, right? Go prove by go doing, and I promise you that will get you further. Um, there's, again, like it's common sense. The more you can demonstrate the value quickly, the more people are going to listen. Um, I found that work all the way through my career. My final comment is whatever you do, don't delete your estate. Um, I had that when we were building out, and it's someone who won't be said, but it's, you know, Simon Spout, not that way, who also works at Enabler. Um, he, he deleted our entire estate. He, what's the command? If he can delete something. Yeah, some, something like that, right? And he literally deleted our entire Cube estate. Don't do that. If you are trying to convince someone to, hey, say, double down on Cube and, hey, double down on this, whatever you do, don't delete. Um, however, take the learnings as you go along, right? We, we, in my head, I thought I was going to get absolutely crucified, but actually people rallied around me and just went, you know what, it doesn't matter. Actually, go learn from that and identify what are the things you want to change and what are the things you want to improve, and then go put them in place. Google say this well. Um, at Google, you don't get fired for making a mistake. You get fired for making the same mistake twice. All right, and take that away as my final message. Cool. So that's all for tonight's session. The next session, as we keep on, you know, telling you folks, will be more about executing on this journey, executing on some of the, you know, strategy things and the deep dives, technical deep dives. One last thing I would say about the whole session, if you didn't pay attention, you were sleepy or whatever. One thing I would say is platform engineering, SRE, all of this, treat all of this as a product. And as Rack said, and he said this, and this is very powerful, any tech, any business case is a business case. Be a tech or be a product. Platform, treat platform engineering as a product. That platform, that red box that Rack showed is a product. How do you build a product? You talk to your customers. Any product, you talk to your customers and customers are front and center. Um, there's, there's a very common saying in product marketing world, and I didn't knew this until I started talking to some product marketeers, is 
customer don't give a shit about your product they care about if it can solve their problems yeah if that is very fundamental and think about how you can apply to all what we discussed today just that one saying and you will find the confusion the dilemmas will start unfurling themselves we will do a little bit of that in the next session anyway so please come along um and you know we will maybe do some demos as well if that's fancies um is that it i'll play videos <laughs> i had the demos all right cool that's pretty much it from us folks um i know it's been a very long winded presser but there's a lot to go through um so there are some still here some beer and we'll get some cold beer out but are there any questions yeah free so i'll repeat the question uh, and summarize it as well how do you uh, keep on improving and innovating and moving when the technology is moving so fast and you're already you know stabilizing your own products sure. um, i I'll, I'll say a few things i think is um why do you need to evolve your technology now uh, it's a, it's a flippant flippant question right okay Yeah. So, so sorry. There's a couple, a couple of things to say there. So, it was a flippant question because my, my my answer is really grounded in why are you trying to move your technologies forward? Right? Are you lining up behind your consumer or are you lining up behind new tech for the sake of it? I can't answer that. You'll have to work that out in terms of your business, right? I think two. There's definitely a point for me, which is if you kind of listen to if you listen to the sub subtext of what we've kind of described today, and we'll go into it in a lot more detail next time around, the, the engineering of the solution is almost kind of irrelevant. It's actually putting wrappers around that of how you think about something as a product. And unfortunately, unless you folks wanted to stay here for four or five hours and have two meals, which we can do next time if you really want it, we couldn't cover it all today. But really what we talk about a little bit next time is actually how do you start to bring product centricity into your development cycles? Um, I hear what you're saying around 10 year cycles but actually there are other organizations that are in the same boat. If you look at mainframes for banks for example what we're now starting to see is SaaS products and cloud based products that are iterating every 2 weeks in terms of new feature drops. That doesn't happen just with the product centricity what it happens with a mature engineering cycle behind it. So what they're doing is they might be dropping features but actually there might be this ability underneath the level of automation the level of platform engineering the level of abstractions that allows them to actually execute at pace and play catch up right I, i don't proclaim to kind of know the air industry very well um but i imagine it's no i imagine it's not too dissimilar to global financial systems i imagine it's not too similar to health systems that are looking after you know heart rates or whatever it may be um i think there are ways that you can build into that which then allows you to future proof and allows you to iterate technology choices but Pratik might disagree um but we'll be talking about that next time yeah no definitely we'll be covering some of that next time and i i agree uh because your reason to innovate your reason to change has to be grounded on what your organization is based on and what your customers want if your customers are happy with your product might not want to change um if you are innovating because there's you know competition that might outrun you that's a very different question and at that point you have to make decisions as to where can you make those changes it might not be the product itself it might be the underlying infrastructure so there are various you know permutations and combinations of why you should change and where you should change which we might cover next time there are some spicy questions in the chat mm. as well uh, we'll take a couple of them because i know we are running out of time um so we'll probably we'll take one from catherine no, let, let, let's just finish off in melbourne because Yeah he won't he won't I didn't want to Let's get get a question go for it so uh what Simon just said was uh Pratik and Rax you guys were awesome <laughs> um I don't have a question which is on her off uh what Simon asked was a um when you have the opportunity to build a platform a uh, opportunity to buy a platform why bother building one investing in one a uh, good question um I I I think one of the things that we've done previously and, and I try and push for is Um, an organization needs to think an organization needs to think about points of parity and points of differentiation in an ecosystem like we are today where technology is integrate 
business services integrated. Think about banking now. Banking is no longer, hey, this bank looks after everything. You're looking at a massive ecosystem of things that combine together and best of breed to give you an end-to-end -end banking service. You first need to establish what are your points of differentiation and points of parity. If it's a point of parity, then don't bother. Right? Just go buy it. There's no points of parity. When you start thinking about subtleties like uh, payroll or global servicing, for example, what tends to happen is your business process is so complex that you can't use out the box. So what you end up then doing is bastardizing out the box. Now, it's a fair question. A fair question, not, not say yours wasn't, a different take on your question would be is, should you be investing in solving a bastardized process or should you be redesigning your process for simplicity? You know what? If you need a job, you can come and work for me and we can go, have, go, go, ask, go ask some of those questions together. It's a, it's a really fair question. Uh, after we've finished. <laughs> cool. Uh, probably time to take one or two questions from the chat and then we'll close it off because we're running way over time. Um, this I'm, is a, I'm not. I can be here all night. <laughs> this is a spicy one for you, Rax. What's your view on being cloud agnostic versus going all in with one cloud provider? Uh, the, the balance part of me and the, you know, what I should be saying professionally is, you know, it's a, a choice and pros and cons and abstraction layers. Part of me turns around and says, you know what, if you can prove you're really good at one cloud, then worry about the second. Because most organizations that I talk to and most organizations I've worked with can't even do one right, let alone trying to do two or three. And let, a, let alone trying to create abstraction layers that are agnostic. Now, there are technologies that help. Cube helps. There are CD tools that help. There are things that help sit across them. There are potential solutions around data in terms of solutions like Snowflake or whatever else it may be, right? Whether, again, it's persistent or non-persistent data. There are things that help, right? And there are things, there are good reasons for why you want to go agnostic. Um, I, I hear it. Um, I'll say two things. I've worked in highly regulated industries, and although it's something that's desirable, it is not a requirement or a mandate. And two, my first point, if you're going to go about trying to, if you're going to really go about being serious about agnostic, please, please, please get your house in order and make sure you can do one right. Because the complexity of not getting one right and doing two is not twofold, it's exponential. Cool. That's a good one. You might disagree. Though. No, I totally agree. Um, a last question for the day is, so there's a long question, but I'll read the question part of it. So the question is, which part of platform should be provisioned and controlled by platform engineers, and which part should be provisioned by the application? Rex. I feel like this is an exam. Like, Pratik <laughs> and Simon are kind of looking at me going like, um, this is the test of three years. Um, I, I think all of platforms should be agnost uh, abstracted away from engineers. So I think all of platform should be platform engineer control. I don't think it's a journey you can get to in six months or 12 months. I think it's ongoing. I think a natural separation for me starts to kind of line up behind how Pratik was explaining build, run, operate, uh, or build, run, observe, measure. Um, I think my envision would be as an application team should not be touching platform whatsoever. It should be a black box to them, and it should really be a black box. Um, in the short term, there are natural divisions you can kind of balance and, and settle on. Um, I kind of sit there and go, that's going to be dependent upon your maturity, your organization. We, we see one of two things. And I saw a comment earlier around certain platform engineering teams are really light on, only have three or four people and are, are tithering around the edges. Some platform engineering teams are quite heavy. Um, the more you can push into your platform engineering team, I'm a big advocate because it means that the rest of your engineering teams can be building consumer value rather than waiting on repeatable tasks that I think you can abstract once and once only into a platform team. Absolutely. I think, yeah, the, the whole purpose of the platform engineering paradigm is centralizing uh, a lot of effort which is repeated across your application teams, right? So the bits that are unique to them, they might still need to control and they can drive it via configuration. They can leverage on same defaults provided your platform engineering teams. But that if you impose on them that they have to manage certain parts of platform, let's say you go and say, you know what, you run on special nodes on Kubernetes, you manage those nodes, it's going to degrade their value of the platform. They might as well go, why are we then running on your platform? We'll run our own. And that's where the diversion and the cracks appear. 
So a platform engineering team responsible for platform should run the entirety of it. Um, and folks in the application should worry about customer value or business value. Uh, I know, Pratik, so that was the last question, but we've got a few people in Sydney that have actually oh, stayed sure. and listened to all of that. So we should definitely check if there's any questions in Sydney before we... Question or comment? Oh, there's Brad. Hello, Brad. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, we actually don't have any questions here at the moment. I think the questions that we've had pretty much answered what we were after. Okay, I oh, know. Go on, give him one. Give him one. Right. right. Another question we had. So, we talk about observability and we call that out on its own. Why aren't we calling out some life security? Because that's pretty big on its own. And we always give that last thought. And in my experience, when it comes to platform, it kind of bites us in the ass towards the end when we need to it's start recording. thinking more about security and we don't give enough thought at the start. Cool. Uh, so, so, just uh, rephrasing the question. Uh, why we called out secure observability as a separate thing, why not security? Because security is also important. Um, we didn't call out testing. No, no, hold on, bear with me. Yeah. Right, we, we didn't call out testing. We didn't call out uh, functional testing of a consumer experience. Because for me, uh, and I, I, we didn't call out architecture. We didn't call out design decisions. Because for me, they're all functions of execution. And I, security professionals will disagree with me on this. And me and Ali have had debates about this. And Ali's at the back again, the guy in the black uh, uh, jumper at the back. Um, I believe that those things like testing or architecture or security, they are functions of execution, not stage gates of execution. So for me, they should be built into your pipelines. They should be built into the foundations of your platform. They should be built in to the foundations for how you operate and how you execute. The knowledge bases of your engineers, the knowledge bases of your teams, right? I don't think, and I'm now spitballing, I don't think they should be standalone capabilities that impact you either left or right. So I have an issue about shift left because I don't think things are about shifting left. I actually think, Things are around reformatting and redesigning how we think about certain outcomes, which happens to be the answer, which is further left of the chain. I don't think you do security left. I think you rethink security. I think you don't do testing left. You rethink security left, right? So for me, that's how I think about stuff. Um, it's a fair call out. Yeah. There are components that you could include in there which are around security. But for me, it's, you know me pretty well. There are bones of contention I have, and that are you an execution path or are you part of execution is one of them. Yeah, um, and also in the, which we'll see in the next uh, one anyway, when we deep dive into some of the build aspects of it, security is not a thing on the side as Rack said, not orthogonal, it's part of everything. It has to be done with everything. It can't be just your security, you're in charge of security. It's not gonna function that way. It is the same paradigm. We are like your DevOps. You're going to DevOps all day. It's not going to work. So in the next execution stage, we will definitely touch on this. Definitely, definitely not getting agenda items for the next session. Cool. <laughs> there will be a lot. Um, all right. Cool. Looking at the time. Thank you very much, folks, especially in Sydney who hung out and listened to us ramble on about an hour, more than an hour. And thanks for folks who turned up in Melbourne as well. Thank you very much. Um, and folks who joined online, thank you. And thanks for your patience. But have a good evening. If you can drink a beer or two, please go ahead. And we'll see you in the next one. I am recruiting. I am recruiting night. as well. No, no, forget him. <laughs> forget him. <laughs> Enabler, reach out. Enabler.com.au. <laughs> I, I don't have a T-shirt, but if you join me, I'll get you a T-shirt. Thank you, folks. Cool. Catch you, folks. Thank you.